All right, so we are here to talk about Apache Drill today. So we're going to give a quick overview on what Apache Drill is. I'm going to talk a little bit about query execution, and I'm going to spend a substantial amount of time demonstrating Apache Drill for you. One of the really fantastic things about Apache Drill is that it works with Hadoop. The more fantastic thing, in my opinion, is not that it works with Hadoop, but that it'll run on anyone's laptop. It's all in Java. If you've got a Java virtual machine, unpack it, run. You're, you're good to go. It even comes with sample data built into it for you to get going. So, who here has used Microsoft Excel to query data? Show of hands. Oh, come on. I don't believe it. I, come on, be honest. Raise your hands up. Everybody here has probably put data into Excel and used filters to try and query data out of those data sets. I only use Hadoop. <laughs> it's against my religion, but I'm admitting it. So, who here that has done this has run into a wall and Excel barfs and can't load the data set you've got. Your alternate solution is to go into a relational database. Right? So you go through the time making sure your data is nice and clean, get the data pushed in, run a SQL query. Well, the nice thing about Apache Drill is it will do that for you without loading into a relational database. You have the ability to query flat files on your local file system. This is, in my mind, kind of the bread and butter of anyone that wants to query data, that wants to do any type of data analytics on any size of data. So Apache Drill was modeled after Google's Dremel white paper. Uh, other projects have attempted to implement their, their thoughts from that paper. Uh, I don't know that any of them have come uh, really full circle on meeting all of the requirements that are there. Uh, none of them thus far have really been forward looking into what else could actually be wanted. So Trill brings the concepts of Dremel in addition to flexibilities that, well, Google doesn't necessarily care about. So being able to support a broader range of data formats, data sources, Right? Google builds their software for Google. Right? They're not going to make any bones about it. Nobody's going to hold them accountable for it. But what's nice about it is that the concepts that they documented have now been turned into something that go more broad range, more flexible, meet more use cases. The design goal of Drill was to be able to scale to 10,000 plus servers and be able to process petabytes of data and trillions of records in seconds. Now, I don't know how many seconds, but that's the rough measure. A billion seconds? <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Billions of seconds. Not, not quite the intended, but I guess we might get there. <laughs> um, so the community for Apache Drill is shaped uh, primarily from a mentor perspective by MapR, um, many university members that are out there, the committers, uh, they actually, I'm, I'm most surprised by the fact that people from Oracle have actually committed code to this project. Uh, it actually goes a long ways in my opinion of having a good opinion about Oracle. Uh, Orkinworks has actually pulled code out of Apache Drill and used it in TES. So the amount of knowledge that is backing the Apache Drill project is reasonably substantial. So when you take, you know, I'm sometimes a fan of this, I'm sometimes not. When you take the combined years of experience of the people that are working on Apache Drill with their time spent on working on SQL engines, we've got over 150 years worth of experience building this. It is ANSI SQL 2003 compliant. It's not SQL-like, okay? The question you really have to ask yourself is do you really want to use a SQL-like syntax? kind of like asking if you want to use a QWERTY-like keyboard, right? We've kind of tolerated 
working with SQL-like syntaxes because people say, I can make it do most of what I want, what you want, and it's going to get you most of the way there. But at the end of the day, if it's not fully ANSI SQL compliant, you lose out on the broader range of integrations and platforms that are out there. Right? All of these tools that have been built by all of these companies that I don't care about, all plug in. But the nice thing is, just because I don't like a product doesn't mean it's going to saddle anyone else with its limitations. Right? Any of these tools that you've got that talk JDBC or ODBC are going to be able to talk to Drill. They're going to be able to use Drill as that SQL execution engine against big data. Some of the other contributors that are not explicitly listed here uh, that are pretty notable, uh, Facebook, Visa, Mesosphere, not, uh, not really small companies out there that you know, don't care. You know, they're taking a vested interest in this project for a reason. So, it started years ago with the NoSQL concept, right? In the last year or so, maybe two years, the concept of not only SQL has become the new nomenclature for NoSQL, right? So when you want to build a platform like this, you've got to consider how do you preserve what is already in the marketplace for SQL. So ANSI SQL is in fact ubiquitous. If anyone ever argues with that, just smack them in the face and walk away, don't argue. It's just not worth your time. It's not to say SQL is bad, SQL is SQL, right? It's just a structured query language. People who do analytics, it's the bread and butter, right? I, I hear people all the time say, I, I need something that works with R. And I say, really? Because I hear this person over here say they want something that works with Python. I say, can you talk JDBC or ODBC? And they say, yeah, I can. I say, great, then you can use this. When you've got a bunch of different technologies getting put in place, architecturally speaking, it might look pretty on paper, but it's a pain in the butt to manage. People don't want to have to move from platform to platform, even within a platform like the Duke, to be able to solve their problems. They want to be able to go to one place and make it work. And when you get down to it, if you want to run this in the enterprise, you need all of the support that's going to make it enterprise capable. So what's really unique or great about Drill? Well, this is where the greater minds had to come together and figure out what it does it really take to take SQL on Hadoop to the next level. So a flexible data model. This is imperative. Right? When you're talking about rows and columns, it's flat data. Right? You know your limitations. You've got to make sure everything's clean on input. You're good. You're happy until you have to go evolve your schema. <clears throat> Who is it that has to do the work? I have been riddled with this in pretty much every job that I've ever had. I've got a database. Who's my DBA? Right? What's the cycle time to get the work done? In a platform like this, it doesn't matter. You take out the bottleneck. You are your own bottleneck. You can only work as fast as you can work in this case. And quite frankly, the scalability factor. This is the thing that really, in the Hadoop world, removes that barrier. Right. Why do people want to move off of standard RDBMSs and do do? Because it could scale. They didn't get off of RDBMSs because they hated SQL. They got off it because the platform wouldn't scale, wouldn't work. So if you can bring this back and offer it as the platform, suddenly it merges the two sides into a happy little playland where people aren't fighting anymore. <laughs> so Drill does this by schema discovery on the fly. So this is not schema on right. This is not predefining uh, what your schema is before you read it, like with Hive. This is literally, you've got files, you've got data somewhere, query it. 
Go. You're done. So one of the things that's really fantastic about this is you now have the ability to query multiple types of data sources at the same time. So this query is not overly complicated, but Apache Hive can't handle this. So Impala uses Hive under the covers. Spark SQL supports Hive under the covers with the Sharp library that was originally built. <laughs> Everybody likes Jack. <coughs> so for semi-structured data, you know, I've got HBase. I want to query it. What should stop you from it? Right? It's just another data source. Granted, there's not a single person here that should be surprised that a relational database can't query HBase. That's obvious. But there is no support for Hive to query HBase yet. It's been being worked on for about the last eight or nine months, but there's nothing really substantial there. Just, it's not there. Impala can't do it, Spark SQL can't do it. Spark can talk to HBase, but Spark SQL can't query HBase unless you pull the data in first. And it is all because they require that metadata definition be created beforehand. It has to be there. It has to have that metadata store to read. I like that. So from just a general landscape picture for you, I'm not going to read any of this off. Uh, I will make the presentation available afterwards if you want to pine over all of this data. But basically, you end up getting kind of the best mix of features and functionality with Drill. Uh, the only other thing on here that has ANSI SQL support is Presto. Uh, Presto. Can anyone, Presto was released about a year, year and a half ago, roughly, by Facebook. There is also uh, Lingual from Cascading. Sorry? Lingual. Cascading, Lingual, that uh, claim to support uh, So, yeah, support HBase. sorry, can support HBase. Can support HBase. So, Drill brings the ability to support many different sources of data. So, in the first implementation that I worked on of Hadoop. Uh, we had data getting stored in HBase. We had uh, data going to flat files. Uh, we had no conceptual capability of ever bringing those two together. And to now go back and force people to uh, restructure the data formats, right? Reprocess them so that Hive can read them properly. It's not out of the question. It's not super complicated, but it's not really what anybody wants to be doing, right? You want to spend your time on solving a problem, not on figuring out a way to engineer a way to figure out how to solve the problem. So, if you notice the record, the JSON record that's here, those two records are not the same. Drill can query those in the same file. So the first one has hobbies and district, the second one has hobbies and preschool. And because Drill does schema on the fly, it has the ability to actually be able to query these as it goes. So record by record, it can actually make the appropriate adjustments on how to read those records and how to allow you to query them. So the model is extremely flexible. SQL engines in general view tables in a spreadsheet-like manner, rows and columns. And 
all the records have the same structure, right? You can't go put a number, or you can't go put a string into a number field. You can't put a number into a Boolean field, necessarily. You were forced to do that. Well, since each record can have a different data structure, schemaless, right? Fundamentally, this is, I'll, I'll use this as strongly as possible, revolutionary in the terms of SQL engines. It hasn't been done before. So if you consider the four data models there, all the models can be re represented by a complex no schema model like JSON. So if I take a table like this and say, I want to represent this in a JSON format, that's very easy. Right? That's effectively this. But you cannot go backwards, at least not easily, and not lossly, or without loss, losslessly. And so Grill, having the ability in this engine to be able to convert everything into a complex schema is just something that it, it's not out there. And because it doesn't have to run through all these complex conversions, it can do it all on the fly. It's fast, it's convenient, it's easy to use. It takes the guesswork out of using an engine like this on big data. And again, I can run it on my laptop. So, query execution. This is a valid query. Pretty simple. Um, the first part of that table definition, distributed file system, DFS, uh, out of the box comes with DFS, uh, CP, which is class path, uh, HBase, and there's one other. I'll, I'll show you all of that in a little bit. Oh, hi, of course. Um, the second portion of it is the workspace. Uh, it's an optional piece of the path. Uh, I'll go through an example in a little bit that explains to you and shows you why that's the case. And then the last part, you'll notice there's back ticks. Those aren't quotes, those are back ticks. Back ticks are the way of telling Drill that this is something to pay attention to effectively. Okay? Yeah. I'm sorry? Can you speak up for us? No support for S3. For what? S3. S3. Amazon S3. Amazon S3. Of course. What? It's a distributed file system. It's supported. It's not on my list. This, sorry, Morris, that S3 is not in my comprehensive three bullet point list. <laughs> there you go. I was happy by Morris. Thank you. <laughs> and then this is where you get into the path. Now, what's really cool about this is when you have a folder with a bunch of files in it, the last spot on here, you can literally just get rid of the file name off here, leave it a directory, and it will actually read all the files in the directory automatically. So if you had 100 parquet files in here and you want to get them all, just leave it up. Will it recurse as well? Uh, no, it will not recurse as far as I'm aware. There could be a wild carding for recursing. I have not actually asked anyone the question. I have not gone looking for it. Do you know why they didn't use URLs for this? URLs? Yeah, because that, that's the standard way to reference anything in the world. Um, like, you know, you can do that with HTML. It actually, under the covers, when I show you what these workspaces are actually defined as, you'll see that it will net out to that. But as far as the query goes, that's not part of the query. And I would think that it's probably slightly abstracted for that reason, to keep it separate from what your definition of your back end is. 
right? So if I actually put in here a URL that was HDFS and then I want to go run it on S3, right? I'd have to then go change my query, but in this case all I have to do is actually change my storage definition. So these queries actually get turned into Java code. And it, uh, It doesn't use just-in-time compilation. It actually uses the Janino engine to compile the code into Java bytecode, and then it brings it together, executes the code across the cluster of Hadoop nodes, or even locally on your machine. Um, if anybody here has any familiarity with Logback, uh, Logback actually uses Janino to do its runtime injection of um, code logic that you can put into XML and it is extremely fast. So as a reference point, there's a lot of information out there on Janino, uh, and there is a link at the bottom down here that goes into some details on Janino. So this is a pretty simple, straightforward model here. Um, the code gets generated. <laughs> it's, it's not very complex. It generates the code on the fly, it loads the class, makes it available. Uh, there's templates there because there's certain patterns that are in place that it's using. Um, the workflow of a query, basically you've got a drill bit. Well, a drill bit, for the sake of nomenclature, is literally just a drill process. So if you have a Hadoop cluster and you install drill on each of your nodes, you're going to have a drill bit running and exposed on each of those nodes. So you have those exposed. You have the ability to query drill via the drill bits. So query comes in, JWC, ODBC, command line, right? All of those functions and features are there. It runs just like a SQL engine does because it is a SQL engine. It goes through all of the uh, execution planning, it goes through uh, cost optimizations. The bits of code are then distributed across those drill bits. They're executed, data is returned to where the query originated at. And you've basically got the zookeeper sitting up on the side here acting as basically the manager making sure that everybody's happy and up and running. Of course, I <coughs> from query going. Uh, because the quality of this problem. Your connection, so in a JDBC <coughs> format, it's literally JDBC colon drill colon ZK for the zookeeper, and then you give it the core. And so it uses the zookeeper library to connect to the quorum, and then it finds out who to talk to, right? Because each of these drill bits are going to register with the zookeeper. The zookeeper is going to know, oh, I've got drill bits running here, here, there, there. So it's going to know which nodes are up, operational. It will farm the requests up. So if it's using Zookeeper to randomize access to the drill bit. Well, I don't know how far I could, I personally could go to say the word randomize, but Zookeeper is used for that purpose. Demonstration. you into drill. When you start up drill on your machine, it starts up a web server. You can manage drill through this interface. Uh, again, this is running a local zookeeper as well. So it uses zookeeper to do all the management, even in a single node model. And I've come into the storage section. So this is where I was mentioning before, these are the defaults that are in here. If you would like to query files on your file system, this storage plugin DFS is the one that you care about. So what's of notable importance here is it has workspaces, root, temp, and db. db is one I've created personally. Root, slash, 
It is not writable. It's very important because Drill, being ANSI SQL compliant, has the ability for you to do create table. So you can't just go creating tables anywhere you feel like. It's dependent upon the configuration of Drill. So the temp path, writable by default. Great. Anybody can go right to temp. The TB location that I've created here, uh, I've given it a default storage format of Parquet. It can have, I believe, just the two options of CSV or Parquet. Uh, Parquet, if you're not familiar, is a column-oriented data format, binary, uh, reasonably efficient, uh, very fast for querying. When you do a create table with Drill, by default, it will use Parquet. It will generate files. So these are the files that it ends up creating. So to Dean's question that he asked, URLs, the connection is defined here. And so it has a way to reference this data. Now under formats, it has table or it has file extension names in here, uh, data types for the type of text, and delimiters for these types that are here. So I actually created, yeah, I created one here called NDB. Uh, I was playing around with a data source that is the uh, National Nutrition Database, and they use tildes as their field separators. I created this in here, I was immediately able to go query those files. That's all. Paste it in here, hit update, you're done. So anything that is standard text file delimited, if it's not already in here for the extension type, you add it in here and you're good to go. Additional information that's in here is when you are running queries, you can come in here and actually look at the status while a query is running. So clearly I don't have any running right now, but there's some information left over from this running. It breaks it up a few different ways for you. Shows you the physical plan that it came up with. So you've got a very strong ability to come in here and get to the details that you care about. Now, this also does fully implement the uh, information schema. That's part of ANSI SQL. So you can run those queries as well. There are some metrics in here so you can get an idea of how it's performing while you're running it. And then from a I really care what's going on perspective. This is basically running JSTAC and tracking what all is going on in that engine. You can query from here as well, but I personally prefer to go to the command line. I don't like running queries from the web browser. Who knows when I'm going to accidentally kill it. So, just to show everyone what it takes to actually get started, uh, SQL line is the command line utility that comes with Drill. And this is all it takes to get going with Drill. It doesn't take too long to start up, but it is going to start up the uh, web server that I mentioned, and I'm good to go. So all commands are listed here. Uh, notice that the commands, there is an exclamation point in front of these commands. So if I type quit, it's not going to. It wants bank quit. <laughs> Don't want it to happen. <laughs> so I've got a data set here that I want to start working with. Um, before about a month ago, I never used Drill. Okay. 
I pulled down the crime data statistical information from the city of Chicago. There's about, what is it, 5.5 million records, 1.3 gig CSV file. On a special choice or just? Well, specifically, I wanted to see if it was safe where you live, Boris. Okay. <laughs> looking, I'm looking out for you. And that's why I also pulled down the sex offenders list in the city of Chicago. <laughs> I wanted to see if Boris was on it. <laughs> to be honest. And he's lucky he wasn't on there. Mike Single, on the other hand, he wasn't on there either. I was shocked. <laughs> really thought he might be. We all wondered. We all wondered. What's that? He lives in Scotland now. What do you expect? Oh, yeah. So I've pulled together a bunch of queries just to show everyone what you can actually do here. So it gives you the data in a nicely formatted, what you would expect a command line interface to give you. Um, but you've got the ability to see the schemas that are defined, uh, any security owner information that's there is mutable. That's a really interesting one because when I first started messing around with this, I tried to do a create table at a path that wasn't mutable and I didn't notice, I wasn't paying attention, I didn't fully understand how the workspace definitions were and that there was in fact a is writable flag there. I just thought, hey, I'm happy, everything works. Uh, it didn't work. Um, so thus I created my own little play place called dfs.db and I can go write anything I want there. So, there's views. Okay, this is kind of nice, right? You've got these different data sources. Yes, Boris? Um, what's the meaning of creating a table? Are you creating a schema definition for the existing file, or what does this <coughs> I'm sorry, can you ask one more time? Um, when you, you keep saying create table, uh, create table. Create table, yes. What does it do? It creates the schema definition for the existing file, or it does something else? So create table, you know, let me just bring up an example. I'll skip ahead, just for course. Um, I've got a create table in here. I actually take my crime data and create a table out of it, just to show what the speed difference is between querying a CSV file that's <laughs> 1.3 gigs or a parquet file that ends up being 600 megs. And so I'm actually creating my table out of a query to a CSV. And I'm actually giving it column names for every column that I'm querying. And it's generating the parquet file for me that I can now query that has named columns in it. Does that answer your question, Morris? Yes. Uh, no. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm trying to compare this, for example, with Pi. You can get the file and you can overlay schema definition on the file. You have to be able to do there, that. There's no real schema definition here. It's literally just saying you have a column and it's going to write data to it. It's not going to check the data types, anything like that. Uh, you could have a column that's null. There, there's no values in the entire column. Right, right. I understand. But if we take, for example, CSV file, I can split it by value. But I don't know whose name to assign to the values. Right. This so when you do create table, it's not going to know names to assign to it. You have to give it to them. Okay. So can I create table on top of the existing file? Uh, this doesn't create a table on top of the existing file. It creates a table separately. It extracts all the data from the file and creates the parquet files. So they're then two separate files. They have no lineage to one another. They are separate at a point in time. Right, but uh, let's take type of example. Uh, for example, I have a deleted file, and now I can create the definition of this file that will allow me to run type queries. Right, Drill will just query these regardless. This table, so what I think really what you might be asking for is a view. Right? You want to present column names for things that may not have already had column names. Yes. That's, I'm pretty sure you're really talking about creating a view. 
Creating a table is actually going to create a table of data. Yeah. So I, I, I think what he's asking is, he's not sure where the key is coming from, but I think, if I'm understanding it right, when it, when it reads the CSV file, it reads the header record, and no, then no. it becomes the key. No, it, 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 it doesn't read the header record. No, Literally, in this, in this query I'm showing you here, I'm, I'm saying for column zero as rep ID. So I'm giving it a name, rep ID. Okay, so you're doing this on the fly. You are saying the column name and the column number. And you're right. Okay, yeah. So if I wanted to create a table with only three of these columns and not care about the rest of the data in the CSV, that would just be my table. Can it read header columns? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. What about typing? Does it know what types for these columns? No. Uh, Parquet may be intelligent enough as it's getting the data in from a compression standpoint, uh, but it doesn't have any implicit types here. Yep. Yeah. When you give a uh, column name for uh, three of your columns and the rest of them leave passages, what will be your name? If, if my select was only three columns uh -huh. from the table, uh -huh. Right, then the table I'm creating is only going to have three columns. So what happens to the rest of the columns from the CSV file? They stay in the CSV file. Okay. I, if I'm creating a table, select column one, two, and three from CSV, and I'm creating a table from that, then I'm getting a new table of three columns. Okay. being created as Parquet, is that set in the configuration? Or is it in the syntax? Those great things. I'm sorry, can you ask the question again? The fact that, it, that the, the new table that you're creating in the Parquet file format, yeah. is it predefined in the, the configuration? Or is this something you can specify in the syntax? Um, I don't remember if it's in the syntax or if it's in the definition of where you're storing the data. Uh, the option is there. I th I, no, I think there is an override for it for you to be able to specify what it is. I think your file had an extension. If you go back to your, your create statement, I think you had an extension that specified Parquet. Or maybe it's in crime data. You might be right. It might be in the definition of crime data. Yeah, I don't. I don't yeah, I, th I think there is an option for you to choose what type it is, though. Oh, I know what you did. Your, your config file had this DB workspace set up to do, do Parquet. Yeah, right. So I'm creating this in the DB workspace, which is defined to default to Parquet. So in this query right here, uh, a very important detail is that I've got some data types here. So you do have the ability to type things in the platform. So there's casting on queries. So when you query HBase, for example, who here can tell me what is stored in HBase? Garbage. Wow. <laughs> bytes. <laughs> Just bytes. So when you query HBase, and let's say you've got 10 columns in a row, and you get that back, what are you going to get back? You're just going to get back bytes. So you can cast that with drill. And then it'll return it happily for you, convert it appropriately. And there are a lot of examples on the Drill Wiki site that show you how to do casting, what the different types are. Very easy. So let's talk about crime data. So
So querying the actual CSV file off the disk, and granted, it's a spindle disk, it's not solid state. Um, every time I've run it, it's been about 20 to maybe 20 some seconds. Um, not bad, not super fast, not, definitely not slow, and far superior to me having to take this data and go load it in somewhere else to go query it. Um, so, 28 seconds. Now, this query, pretty simple. Select count star, incidents, um, column five. I happen to have looked at this data once before, obviously, to know which columns I really would care to query. Um, I am doing a group by on the category. So, interestingly, theft is the top category in the city of Chicago. Or is it? Well, it depends on how we look at this, right? So, when you look at this data, there's a, actually a category type and there's, uh, there's a subcategory. And so they break each of these down in a different way. So it's kind of important for us to you know, go a step further and say, what exactly are we looking at here? Because quite honestly, theft could be, you know, Boris stole my pointer out of my backpack and I report it, it's a $5 issue, who cares, right? Not a single person in here is going to feel bad for me. Well, we'll never do it. That's true. Ooh, that's, that doesn't look as good. So we have, what is that, about 840,000 incidents of battery. Well, theft might have more total, but the top two from the category are battery. That sounds bad. So that query was 17 seconds, not bad. So the next thing that I would have done here would be just create the table, poof, it's done. Uh, just to give you some rough metrics on this, when I took this 1.3 gig file, converted it to parquet with the create table, it took eh, five minutes, here it is. Not bad. If you're gonna be querying it a lot, right, again, I'm working on a local system here. I'm not really worried about scale. I'm not really worried about running it on the Hadoop cluster. If I'm going to be querying these files a lot, it's probably going to be beneficial for you to go through the exercise of creating a table and cutting your query times down. So since I've already done that, Let's basically run the same query, but from my table. And so you'll notice that the syntax here has cleaned up a little bit, um, because the DFSDB workspace I've given it on my machine is opt drill DB. So I've taken all that out of the path, uh, because I'm not dealing with undefined um, delimited data where I have to identify it as columns, bracket, zero, one, two, whatever. Um, you've got the ability now, with the names that I created from the table, to use that to clean up your queries. So, that query ran in less than half of the time it took for the original one. So, reasonably, reasonably beneficial. Yeah, but that's exactly what Google is doing. What is exactly what Google is doing? Because uh, Google is uh, running Gravel on the column oriented specialized format. They take your data, they convert it into it, and then they run their queries very fast. Sure. I mean, at the end of the day, yes, what you are saying is if you want fast performance, create specialized data format. Yes, if you want to play around, play with JSON, but you are doing this on your own. Well, in this parquet model, right, I took a CSV and converted it into parquet. Yeah. If you've got JSON data, you're not really going to do much with it beyond that. Right, but uh, JSON, I can guarantee you, if you can take the same file in JSON, it will take you about five to 10 times longer to run exactly the same query. You know, I wish I could have tested this. The city of Chicago actually allows you to download JSON, but it's not really JSON. 
it's not JSON format. They call it JSON, but it's not. So I couldn't use it. Right, but theoretically, you are doing two things. First of all, it's binary, so your marshalling and unmarshalling is about five to six times <coughs> faster. The second is because it is column oriented, they are doing skews. And this might be another thing to put Yeah, so Parquet is optimized as opposed to a CSV. The execution time is probably not taking any longer between the two. It's really disk I.O. and serialization that we're dealing with. Of course. Well, I, I, I think at the end of the day, though, that's a good thing, right? Because, I mean, if I'm trying to query large amounts of data, I only want it to access what I actually need. So I don't, I don't see <laughs> the downside to that. Oh, no, no. Yeah, there shouldn't be any downside to this. This is merely just a information for the sake of sharing. So now what I want to do is I've come up with this idea that I've got the registered sex offenders list. And I want to join my crime data and the sex offenders list on the blocks. Now, if you go through the city of Chicago's data, it has in there a block identifier for every block that an incident occurs on. So I'm actually able to join on these and come back with <coughs> with the question, which is how many incidents happened on a block that has a registered sex offender on it? That's question number one, right? If I only get you know, a few thousand, I probably don't care. It's probably fruitless. But I've got 474,000 incidents. That's not a small amount. <coughs> so I didn't actually show you, we should probably do a quick check just to be sure we know how much data we're actually dealing with in the crime data. What's the time range? Uh, this is from 2001 until present. Um, so let's just do a quick count. Okay, so like I said before, it's about 5.5 million. We've got 474,000 incidents that occur on blocks where there is a registered sex offender living. So we're at almost 10%. That's that's not nothing. That's actually pretty substantial, in my opinion. So I would say that it's relevant to say, what were these incidents that occurred? Because like we looked at before, theft is the number one, but the next two are battery. Well, if there's 474,000 incidents and they're all theft, well, oh, that's not good. So out of 440,000, or 447,000, or 470,000, whatever it was, we've got 85,000 that are battery for registered sex offenders. That's probably not good. That's probably bad. So I personally probably don't want to live on any of the blocks that sex offenders live on. Now, I'm only drawing a correlation. I'm not in any way, shape, or form saying there is causation here. As someone has pointed out to me in the past, it could literally be that registered sex offenders just can't find nice places to live. <laughs> so that being said, we can you know draw some conclusions here. So let's change this up a little bit. So we're going to join these together again, and <coughs> just to get an idea of what those subtypes really are here. So domestic battery simple and simple. That's not really terribly helpful as conditional information, but within the realm of battery, Aggravated other dang weapon? Really? <laughs> City of Chicago? And that's not an that's not a typo. That's 5,400. <laughs> yeah, it's down further too. That's great. Be careful of people and their dang weapons. All right, that's just that's rough. 
Come on, we don't want to rationalize it. <laughs> so, you know, these top handful are pretty big, and then you get down to some pretty small stuff. So, not bad. So, we didn't really look at how many total battery incidents occurred on those blocks by year. That's kind of important, right? Because who knows? Maybe all these happened in 2001, and there's been nothing since. Anybody? Probability and statistics of that? <laughs> I don't have either. So this was one of the most complicated queries I had to figure out how to do. Uh, you'll see that I've got an extract statement in there. Um, the documentation just started coming together on the wiki for that, uh, doing date manipulation. It took uh, quite a bit of finagling to figure out how to get the city of Chicago's date format that they're using in here to be parsed out properly and to convert it and pull up just the year portion of it. So I did it. Uh, you'll also notice that in the group by, I have the exact same extract statement. Okay, this is a great learning opportunity. You go start using drill. You say, I've come up with this fantastic thing I want to select, and I want to group by it. You cannot group by a name. So if you give that a name and say, Jim's here, whatever, you cannot group by it right now. ANSI standard does not require it be supported. I have a JIRA ticket open for it. It's been accepted. We'll see when it gets done. It's technically part of the SQL parser, and the SQL parser actually comes from a separate uh, project, I believe it's called the Optique project. But we've got our query. So it looks like we kind of peaked around 2003, and it's been on a slow decline pretty much every single, oh, 2011 to 2012, it went up a little. And 2014 is not complete yet, so that's not bad. I would say maybe that's police enforcement helping out. Maybe. Maybe people are just, I don't know, less likely to beat people year over year. Um, so the query functionality that's here is basically if you can do it in SQL, you can do it here. Uh, the documentation is coming along quite nicely. Uh, it's currently in an alpha release. The beta release, I believe, is scheduled for end of August, roughly. Um, the wiki documentation for functions that you want to use is the part that I would say is the uh, least fruitful currently. Uh, but there's definitely enough there to keep you by, and uh, there's not a lot of user activity on the users list. There's a bit. So I've actually, any questions I have, I go out there and I've got them answered like that. Nice and quick. So, as part of the community, as you start using Drill, you say, this is great, you know what, I, I can use this all the time, this is just so dead simple to use. Join the mailing list, participate. That's how you can give back to the community without giving back to the community. It's the thing that is often overlooked by many people. Does anybody have any questions about these queries, query syntax? Not on the queries, but I had a question on uh, use uh, creating the table on the CSV file. Yep. How long did that process take? Well, that's what I was saying earlier. It took about five minutes ish. Five minutes? Yeah. And then a uh, follow up question to that was for an incremental load on that, let's say if you want real time feeds going into there, how would that work? Would you I wouldn't work be that? creating a single parquet table, most likely. I would create separate parquet files and just keep dropping them in the directory. Okay. And then I could come in and query the whole directory and get all of it. This is all running local on on Mac OS X. Okay. Now earlier when you were, you were talking about a topic, you, you had drill bits in each of these And the main um, drill bit that was passed out to fragments and the other drill bits, how does it know how many drill bits, how does it negotiate like which drill bits to use? And how is all that being managed between the different drill bits? And how does that integrate with Yarn? How does it integrate with Yarn? Uh, I don't think it has to integrate with Yarn first off. So it's just going to take it's just going to take it's just going to take resources on the cluster without like Yarn's knowledge. Um, 
Well, Yarn doesn't manage everything for Hadoop anyways. So I would, I'm not overly concerned about it from that perspective. But so if you have a heavy query, what you could be, you know, you have a heavy query, you could be using a lot of resources in the cluster. Yeah. Uh, so the, the question was, how does Drill play with Yarn? Uh, I can't actually answer the question how it plays with Yarn. Um, I don't know that there's any explicit. There's very good documentation for getting drill set up on a Hadoop cluster. Uh, how it explicitly plays with Yarn, don't know. It might be on the site I haven't looked. It should because it should not use it so separate process. It doesn't create processes of the fly. The driplet is there. It's running. Right, the drill bit is in fact there and running. Uh, but I, from, from a, yeah, I don't know how granular Yarn would actually be in a case like that anyways. If you have the process running. I, no, I mean the only integration Yarn should know that part of the memory is used by drill use process. That's the only integration that can be there. But the Yarn's a completely separate execution. Right, so. Well, Yarn is just a resource negotiator. It doesn't execute anything. No fun that. Sort of. Uh, but to Boris's point, uh, it's going to be there running, and it's really going to have memory utilization. It's not going to be spawning jobs on the cluster in the, in the typical map and reduce phases of jobs that would run on a new cluster that Yarn would care about. It's going to be an ongoing process. It's going to sit there and wait for requests to come in. It's the same thing as <coughs> they still didn't do any real quotation. It's exactly the same part of that. Right, now if you, really, if you really wanted to have granular control, what I would say is, you know, here's a suggestion for you to start using Mesos, put it in your data center, put a new bot in, because it can actually manage all of the resources, not just map and reduce tasks. I got a question. Your colleague presented on Spark what, a month ago or so, and was talking about how to the LRU caching, right, uh, for performance. Is there any level of caching that you can do within Drill for performance reasons? Uh, Drill does have caching in it. Uh, I can't personally go into the depth of it right now because I have not used it on the Hadoop cluster. Yeah. So I've got at least 20 colleagues that have, but I've been doing everything wrong. Well, and, and when you're dealing with something like this where you're streaming the data from a file, if you put enough RAM in your system and don't use it, the operating system is going to do some amount of caching for you, just keeping the file in empty memory, right? Right. There's there's lots of technical details that are available for Drill that I'm not putting in this deck because I basically chose to take an approach of show and do versus getting into the lower level technical details. Uh, they are published and they're out there, though. I can I can read files from different data sources, but what if I wanted to create a file or I wanted to pump that file into a different data source? Can I do that? So I don't want to create a flat file based on the, 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 da the data that I queried. I actually want to take that output and push it somewhere else. Can I do that with Drill? I know. So in other words, I could like I, I query all these data sources. I brought my, my 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 data together, and now I want to put it inside of like a uh, well, Lucene index or Oracle. It depends. Or do you want to write code, or do you just want to run from the command line? Uh, what options do I have? I mean, I, I could I could do it. Well, code, it, I could create there's a JDBC files. and an ODBC driver here. Yeah. So if you query and you get results and you want to write them somewhere else and you're writing in Java code, I go. You're writing in Scala, go. Okay. You're in Python. Using ODBC, go. I suppose you can use an ETL tool. Right. Hey. <laughs> yeah, so um, in terms of uh, ANSI SQL support, <laughs> like VML operations, uh, insert, update, delete, do they do any of that? Do they create data? Yeah, all, all commands are here. Uh, windowing functions, like, like row number over partition by. Um, you know, I was actually meaning to look at that. Uh, I haven't tried it. I don't know for sure for uh, row number commands. Um, yeah, I didn't actually get into it when I was messing around. Um, so how is uh, schema validation handled?
terms of like, if, I, if I write a query that I'm calling a column that may or may not exist, right? Is it going to throw an error? Are there cases in which it will throw an error? Others in which it will not? Well, I, I can imagine certain underlying formats will know their schema. Others will be effectively schema-less, like say JSON, right? Where not having a column is not necessarily a problem. Well, so you're basically saying, if I run this query and I request a column that's not there, mm -hmm. well, that's, that's pretty simple. Let's just demonstrate. I'm pretty sure I don't have a block <coughs> column. So the error is here. Primary type is not being grouped. Oh, no. Get rid of the count star. Yeah, that's, that's my fault. <laughs> I'll take responsibility on that. Here you uh, Your alias for columns is incidents. There isn't that. Yeah, get rid of incidents. Right. Well, I don't, I'm trying to figure out what's, what's failure. Is failure one for a fragment? You call count oh. star incidents. There is no incidents. Well, you just. Well, well, that's flaws a, in my query, right? But if it's a fake column, I mean, <laughs> it demonstrates exactly yeah, what we're looking yeah, for. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, still, it's still invalid. Okay. Um, now, yes. there is a way to actually have it show you uh, more error output. And that's one of the ways, but that's not the <laughs> error output I'm looking for. There is. So alter session set exec errors verbose equals true. And that is documented, by the way. I didn't just make it up. So you get a stack trace. Nice. I know, right? You don't get this out of any other SQL engine out there. This is good stuff. Can you go up a little bit? I'm wondering if it actually is dying in the parquet or in the um, in drill. Hold it down. Insertion error. Interesting. Okay, so this is <coughs> so it's in drill that's found. So it doesn't exist. It fails. It's happy. That's so you're, you're querying now from the, the parquet table that you created. Uh, yeah, that was the parquet file. In the so if you went back to your create your earlier create table statement in your text editor. Yeah. Selecting the data out of the CSV file, let's just say a given row didn't have something in the fourth position where you're doing that is I be null. CR, you you get a null. Yeah, if, there, if there's no value there, it'll be null. You can do is null queries, all that fun stuff. Would it be null? Uh, matter of fact, one of these columns here, yeah. uh, that it was a reasonably fun thing to find and discover, is I chose the wrong column at one point doing the query and it gave me this error. And I was trying to figure out what it was, and the entire column for that data in the CSV had no values in 5.5 million rows. They're all empty. And so in the parquet file, because it's optimized, it had nothing. It didn't even store it because it didn't exist. So it's interesting little semantics you get into here and there. Does that have any like execution plan, like explain or anything like that to see? Oh yeah, that's uh, I was showing you that in Chrome. Files. Is that a query? Never mind. Yeah, so these queries here. So <coughs> let's come back in here and let's find a query that's <coughs> against the CSV file. This one. And and so this is the query that's currently running. <coughs> I just executed it. Physical plan, visualized plan. I know it does something. I've seen it before. But yeah, so all, all the planning that it does is here visible, available to you. You can get it all from the command line as well. Just as a reminder, help, 
uh, all of the things that are in here are available to you. Uh, it might, <laughs> they might not all be blatantly obvious how to use them, but the set, uh, alter session set that I had in here, um, commits, So it, there, there's a lot of, you know, this is actually where I found that I could create a table from. Didn't even cross my mind that I could create a table otherwise. <coughs> uh, creating views. When I was uh, inspecting the uh, Metastore, the uh, information schema. So, like I said, um, the back ticks, don't forget about them. Uh, if you notice on the year right here, uh, year is a reserved word. So I've got back ticks on it, telling drill that this is my word. Don't mistake it for the reserved word. If I take, if I take that out of there, it will give me a less than easy reason or the failure. Can you use double quotes for the no. SQL standard? Double quotes are not the SQL standard for that. Pretty sure they are. Ticks aren't explicitly part of the standard. Yeah, back ticks are not. Neither are part of the standard. No. Yeah. Um, So yeah, it doesn't really give me a very clear reason, but there is, uh, out on the wiki, you can find a complete list of all the reserved words. There's a lot. Uh, it doesn't hurt to go give a quick review of it. Did anyone else have any questions on queries? I have a question on uh, actually execution plan on the environment. So let's say you have two such files, large files, distributed across the right? And, and the columns you're joining on, the data can be how does the process actually run? Because you're running on a single node that's coming back to be fast. You're running on a new environment that the data is on. The column you're joining on, the data is on different nodes. How does the process actually internally track? Does the data get moved? Well, so the question is, how does Drill actually query files across different servers in a cluster? And join them, yeah. And join them. Well, I, does the data get moved? Well, data has to move. I mean, think about a MapReduce job, right? Conceptually, that data is moving a lot in a MapReduce job. <coughs> this is simplifying how much data has to get moved, where and when. And so it has at its disposal the ability to read the data, use memory, throw it away when it doesn't need it, talk directly to each other over RPC, right? So it's file. It's bypassing everything else, so it has the ability to optimize based on those things. And, and that's what adds to the problem, right? Uh, yeah, that definitely would deliver better performance. I mean, ultimately, it's not going to be tremendously different from uh, one of the reasons that Spark <coughs> is very fast, which is it uses memory and it uses RPC to talk to the processes on different nodes. So, because it's bypassing everything else. Right? It's reading the data in, it's reading the data in, they shuffle whatever data needs to go back and forth between them, right? They come up with each of their own small fragments of results, they pass the results back. Can I pass a query to drill outside of the command line and outside of... JDBC and ODBC? Or the web browser? Yeah, outside of both the web browser and the command prompt, does it have like a service interface where I can just pass a query to it? JDBC and ODBC. There's no REST or anything like that? That's what I want to know is a REST, yeah. Like a REST interface? Or... Well, that's, the, that's literally the web browser that's sitting here. But I don't want, I don't want to go on to the web browser and actually uh, type it in. I want to... The web browser goes to something. Yeah. Yeah, that's... So uh, you can go to the same thing. So I can talk to the service behind, behind it. And pass in the query. It's no, so why not? Okay. Yeah, right the only thing that you will have to do is you will have to query to keep our field to find the appropriate instance and then send it to the instance. No, no, because. Wouldn't you just post it to the 
Yeah, you, you have the you have the web server, right? So you just talk to the web server, and then it's talking to Zookeeper, right? Well, so, the, right. This server is already doing the work. Right. That's why I say it's in the browser. If I can do it from the browser, but I don't that, want to that do is a REST it. request. Oh, okay. But I don't actually want to type it, right? I want to build an application. <laughs> if you don't type the query, where's it coming from? Yeah, I want to. I don't see the full type. I want to pass it to a post, right? Yeah. A post request. I want to pass the query to. So where'd the query come from? It came from an application, or it came from me, or maybe it's maybe you it's. You just said you didn't write it. Come on, work with me here. No, I, I wrote it. I wrote it, but not in real time. So I, I basically wrote it, and I want to execute this query, but I want to just pass it to a, a service. So it sounds like you're writing code somewhere, though. So yeah, so yeah, but he wants to use a REST interface. Code. He wants yeah. to use the REST yeah. interface. Yeah. So that web interface right there is sitting there. Is it documented? I don't know. So it's it's it's. But I, it's I running can, in a web browser consume, right now. So. so I can write an application to consume it outside of this web browser or this web application. That's what I want to know. You, so you, you have to use JDBC or you can spend the rest of your life trying to figure out how the code works. Okay. Just use JDBC. All right. Yeah. Look. Go look at the code. It's open source. Okay. I don't How hard know if there's a REST interface documented for it, but the web browser <laughs> is RESTful. So since I'm right, able to okay. submit a query from the web browser, that's what I want inherently to so it, is, it is RESTful, that's all. Well, only though if, if the web browser isn't an embedded web server inside whatever it is you would be talking to through, through JDBC. If it's like a separate process, well, way, it's, still it's still talking RESTful. And, and it's submitting. I mean, uh, it's, so no matter it's what, you, you have to be able to send that query to it. Just the JDBC part is a little code. It's a fact. No, no, it's just, it, it's I don't just, need to make the connection. That's just it. That's I, I, I mean, I know how to write that. I want Drill to, to, to make all the calls, all the different data sources for me, but I want to pass the query through a post request, and I don't want to open up a browser to do it. Look, so if there's a no, no, you're, you're not following. Do you okay. see this web form? Yeah. It's a web form. Okay. Yeah, but what's it? Is it submitting? into the process, or is it actually doing a RESTful request to another uh, service? That's my question. It doesn't that's matter, that's my point. Either way, it's an HTTP request. Me clicking this button is an HTTP request. But I have no, 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 you're, you're sending a web form. Exactly. It's still an HTTP uh, request. Yeah, but you can that's hack that if you want it, but that's it not a It does depend right. on whether it generates an HTML for you. Or it's an agent. Also, it's a really interesting discussion, but I don't think it really is. Either way, it's generating, when I click that button, it's generating a request that the web server at 8047 is responding to. That's fine. We'll talk afterwards. That's fine. Questions? Any more? Yeah. So, uh, the journal paper talked about flattening hierarchical data um, for scanning. Uh, does Dremel support, or does Drill uh, support that flattening? Uh, so that was actually something I was talking with uh, Ted about just last week. It's on the schedule to get put in there. Okay. And we were trying to flatten, uh, oh, it was basically just going to be like a, uh, an array of numbers from HBase in a single cell mm -hmm. and have it flatten that to be able to join that against uh, uh, keys from another table. Uh, currently, the functionality is not there. It will be there. Okay. Uh, isn't Parquet uh, was uh, designed to do things? Is, I don't know if Parquet is designed to do that. It's columnary and you can do mm -hmm. those keys. Oh, means. right. But so in the concept of HBase, right? My data is in HBase. If I want to query HBase to HBase, I'm not going to go intermediate to Parquet. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so flat is coming. It will be there. Uh, I cannot answer for you how it does optimization regardless. There is metadata for different data types. Depends on the type of data type you're working on. But uh, it does also apply read the files on the fly. That's right. It does read the files on the fly. And then optimization needs some data. Well, when you say optimization, that's a very blanket, broad statement. Right? What are you trying to optimize? Optimization is, are you doing network-based cost optimization? Are you, right, what type of optimization? If you're saying, I want to be able to read data off of disk faster, or I want to read less data off of disk, those are different types of optimizations that you would be concerned about, right? So it, it really depends on what your specific optimization you're talking about is. 
Okay. The query is I'm talking about. I mean, it, it does create the uh, extend tab, right? The query tab. And it apparently is optimized. Well, it has a physical plan here. Right. There is optimization that's being put in place. And like I said, I can't. I personally cannot go into depth onto any optimizations or what the logic is for it. And as I mentioned before, there is a pretty substantial amount of documentation on the lower level details of drill that are out there, and I've chosen to bypass those in general. Well, and all it could really do is storage level optimization, which for an OLAP query is all you're typically going to get anyway. Um, you know, you can add partitioning and things like that, which might help. But other than that, storage levels where the optimization is going to be, you don't have the indexes or anything like that. Right. Any other questions? All right. So. Go download it, try it, mess around with it, participate in the community, ask questions, post to the boards. The website was actually just updated. It's uh, cleaner now, easier to find the stuff. The .4.0 release uh, for the incubation stage was just released a couple days ago. And that's it, that's all I have. So if you have any tools that you have built to work against a relational database, just alter your queries for where your data is stored in your big data platform and go. Those tools will all work. Uh, like users and groups permissions. Have you messed with that at all? How well is that? Yeah. If you can, I mean, does it have full support and all that? Does Drill have full support for permissions of files? Well, hey, is that, uh, is that, is that what you're asking? I guess I'm trying to draw a, a traditional relational database, right, where you can have tables that are, and as, your, as, a, as me, I don't have visibility into, but as others I can, as other users I can. So how does it handle the users and groups so that I can only see the data I'm supposed to see, not the data that's Right, so when you run a job, uh, there are parameters when you connect to the drill. Sorry. Uh, when you connect to drill, you will give it your user ID and password. And that's... So it will authenticate you. Okay, is, is, that, is that just a... Is the authentication tied into drill or tied to the operating system or uh, ISAP or whatever you want? It's, it's tied into whatever it's connecting to. So if you are connecting to your new platform, mm -hmm. um, if you are connecting to HBase, Right, you're going to have effectively completely wide open everything. If you connect to MapRDB, MapRDB has complete security on every table, on all different types of transactions that occur, and so it's going to lock you down. So whatever you're permitted to do. Uh, if you're trying to get at files in the distributed file system that your user ID doesn't have permission to, you're SOL. It won't okay. let you in because it's going to be enforced at the distributed file system level. Could you explain the drill compiler specific? Because I've never heard of the Geni Genino. Genino and the fact that it merges itself with the like the pre-compiled. So uh, basically, Genino is going to. Uh, okay, so at the step before Genino, the SQL query is going to get converted into Java code. Mm -hmm. Basically, just consider it as being a mapping of A equals B, C equals D. It creates the Java code out of it, it then compiles it, it then takes the templates, it merges them together into an actual class mm -hmm. that gets then loaded by the class loader. Okay. So then it's available, it then gets distributed to the drill bits that are running for the code to execute. Okay. So Janino is, um, 
Like the, generator. Yeah, it's a blank oh. code generator. It is probably the most popular one that's out there, okay. um, especially in the open source community. Okay. So in order to optimize these and increase performance, does it, does it then use, when it says that it uses the pre-compiler, is that how it tried to optimize because of it ran? Once before, it's not going to try to do it again, or uh, no? That type of optimization that? is literally just creating the class for okay. the query that's going to run. So that's going to be even if it doesn't cache that, that it, it's nothing. So it's done. It's so it. fast. Okay. I mean, if you think about running, um, if you think about just compiling a project that has ten thousand classes in it, those projects usually compile in less than a second for ten thousand classes, okay. right? Talk about doing one. It, it's, it's going to be not a blip on the radar. Okay. The, the real performance is going to come when the, when the Java JIT kicks in and starts finding hotspots and making native code out of that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Any other questions? So, uh, the, the, the drill bits are like copies of like a standalone drill executable or something? Or? Uh, yeah, basically, uh, the instance I have running on my machine that actually is a drill bit. So when you install drill onto nodes in a cluster, each node you install it on, when you start the process, that's a drill bit. All right, so uh, the, the, like the question I was asking about like, the joints and stuff like that, uh, let's say you've got you know, some big files that are spread across all these, all these nodes and whatnot. Um, the, in order to do like a join, each of those drill bits would be handling like a little chunks, you know, little blocks or whatever, and they'd have to know which, I mean, uh, you're saying it's a lot of like it's, it's, it's RPC communication that they use to talk to each other. And uh, it's, um, and, but it, it's, it's still done as a MapReduce. No, there's no MapReduce. Aha, so okay, so it is sort of sparkish like that. Well, that's what I said earlier. MapReduce is fun. Especially Yeah, there's no MapReduce job to be generated. That's why this is a low latency system. So, <laughs> uh, you'd be surprised. It's going to be way less than if you happen to do uh, uh, map reduce job. So if you want to do a comparison with Java one chatter, these, these RPC calls are going to be very lightweight. It's, it's like they're, they're going to be very minimal. Although the worker is looking at it. It's supposed to be a single worker. Yes. Yeah. 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 If anybody's using this in production, they should probably smack. It's only, it's only an alpha release. Yeah, no, uh, we're, we're hoping to be in beta at the end of the month. We map R. Yeah. Uh, granted, map R is one of the major contributors. I'm sorry? Uh, so uh, on the one slide that I had up there, map R is the, uh, uh, we have like one of the lead mentors, Ted Dunning. Um, but it's an open source project, so we're not the only ones, but we've been major drivers behind the project. So there's about 40 plus committers to the project. Map R is on San Jose. Any other questions? All right, thanks.